All right. Are we recording? Yep. Yeah. All right. That's the first note I put in mind. Good morning and welcome to another Ra Ra Academy. My name is Tim Brown, WB2PAY. I'm the education coordinator. Uh, Ra Ra Academies are part of Ra Ra's educational and technical programs for both the new and the uh, seasoned licensed amateurs. For information about RARA, visit our website at rochesterham.org. That should be bookmarked on your uh, browser at all times. Our website has the most current information about our club, and you'll find useful links on topics of interest to HAMS. Uh, education programs, VE testing, uh, recordings from past academies, and archives of our newsletter uh, from the RARA RAG. Again, that's rochesterham.org. A few housekeeping tasks today. I ask that everybody keep their microphones muted at this time. Uh, please locate in the bottom of your screen uh, the chat function. Uh, you may submit comments or questions using the chat function. The host or one of the hosts will keep an eye on the chat window and convey your questions to the presenter, at which time you will be asked to unmute in, uh, your microphone and discuss the question. Uh, if you have comments on that question, you can open your microphone and uh, comment at that time. But each time I'd ask you to uh, uh, remute yourself. And uh, if you uh, want to raise your hand, uh, there's a hand function, Alt Y. The Alt key and Y will raise and lower your hand symbol. We might catch that easier than uh, if you don't want to post your question totally in the chat area. And we'll recognize that and give you uh, uh, acknowledgement and have you unmute and ask your question. So let's get started. I want to introduce our presenters. Carl Heinz Kremer is going to be the lead uh, instructor uh, today. We've got Bob Cars, K2OID, uh, Ned Asim, uh, W2NED, and Scott Tice, uh, w, uh, W2LW. Uh, the four presenters who will be uh, talking about their experiences in QRP. And pay no attention to the amplifiers in the background at, at, at some of our homes, okay? All right, over to you, uh, uh, Scott, or uh, Carl Heinz, and uh, please take it away. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, good morning, everybody. Let me get ready here to share my screen. This always takes a minute. And let's get started from the top. So uh, I hope everybody can see my slides now. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, we wanna talk about QRP today, low power. That is like a niche uh, in ham radio where we try to use less power than normal and how much that is. We'll talk about that during the presentation. We have to, uh, four presenters today. Uh, we, some of what we, you will hear uh, will overlap a little bit, but there shouldn't be too much overlap. But uh, if there is, um, it's always nice to hear the same information from different perspectives, and that may make it easier to take away uh, the gist of it. But other than that, uh, there is a good chance that our four presentations will be very different. So I wanna start with uh, just showing you a QRP station on the air. This is me working a parks on the air uh, activation in Florida with my KX2. And you see everything that is required in that picture. In the small picture on the uh, right, you see me and the radio and the left on that bench is the battery and in the background is the antenna. And that truly was everything that I needed. Uh, to make contact with five to 10 watts. So why do we wanna do QRP? Uh, we've invested a lot of money in our amplifiers and uh, why should I turn down my power if I can run uh, full legal power or if I um, have a 100 watt, amp, uh, 100 watt uh, transceiver with that, uh, power knob turned to 11. Back when you took your license test, you may remember that there was a question on the test. Uh, in the current version of the test, it's phrased as which of the following limitations apply to transmitter power uh, on every amateur band. Uh, 
And if you think that as much power or turning the knob to 11 is the right answer, we may have to revoke your license because the right answer is actually uh, only the minimum power necessary to carry out the desired communication should be used. And that actually means uh, in most cases, we should only run QRP power because with QRP power, you can make that communication possible. So in the olden days, uh, QRP used to mean 100 watts or less. less. Uh, nowadays, we understand that it is five watts for CW and 10 watts uh, PAP for single side band. Uh, five watts CW, that is about the power that your nightlight has. Now we can turn the power down even more to QRPP with a lowercase p, and that is less than one watt. And that gets really down to the bare minimum, but you can still make contact with that power level. Um, just to remind you a little bit about what the difference is between these power levels when we go from 1500 watts to five watts, that's a decrease in power of 24.8 dB. Uh, from 100 watts to five watts, it's minus 13 dB. If you are a little bit fuzzy about how the dBs work, let me remind you of that. Doubling the power is plus three dBs, half the power is minus three dB. 10 times the power is plus 10 dBs, one tenth of the power is minus 10 dB. So going from 100 watts to 10 watts is minus 10 dB. When you look at the S meter on your radio, uh, it's supposed to be calibrated to uh, 6 dBs between the different S levels. So if you go from S8 to S9, that's a 6 dB difference in power. Same going from 5 to 6 or 2 to 3. So between two S levels, you have 6 dB difference. That's the theory. Not all radios are that uh, precise, but it's, it's roughly about 6 dBs. So we know that our 5 watt signal is down 13 dBs from a 100 watt signal. And that's about 2 S levels. 2 S levels would be 6 dBs, 3 plus 3 dB. So if your 100 watt signal shows up as an S9, your uh, five watt signal is an S7. Still plenty of uh, power to, to hear it, to work it. And uh, that means QRP actually works. So here is a little bit more about these power level comparisons. Again, we assume a hundred watt signal is S9. If we crank up our amp to full legal limit, we end up with about S9 plus to, uh, plus 12 dB. So we are about 12 dBs over S9. If we go to 25 watts a quarter, we have S8. If we go to six watts, which is roughly about five watts, we have the S7. One and a half watts S6 and 0 0.4 watts. So this is QRPP level S5. So if you can hear a station, that is transmitting with 100 watts as S9, you will still be able to copy them as an S5 if they turn down their power to 0 0.4 watts. Isn't that amazing? So QRP actually works. Uh, and not just when we do the math, uh, also in real life. So now let me talk a little bit about my QRP rigs. And this is how it all started. Uh, back in 1993, this uh, guy N6KR, uh, um, Wayne Burdick, published a design for the NorCal QRP club, and he named it the NorCal or NC40. And that was like the first truly popular QRP rig kit that was available. Before that, you had to source your own parts and uh, make your own designs or copy them from, from books or magazines. But this was like the first really popular kit that was available. And I bought the kit back then, and then I stored it 
for 20 plus years. Uh, never got around to building it until just a few years ago. Um, from that, oh, by the way, N6KR, Wayne, uh, he then continued to do big things in ham radio and co-founded a little company called Elecraft that you may be aware of. So this is like the grandfather of your Elecraft rig. Then I moved on. Um, I actually took a long break from ham radio. And uh, when I got back in four years or so ago, uh, I looked around for uh, an easy way to get on the air. And there was this company, HF Signals from India that had this BitX40 kit for 50 plus bucks. It was pretty cheap. And it was just a board uh, already populated with all the parts. And all you had to do is connect the uh, switches and the part and the encoder and the display, and then put it in the box. So that's what I did. And that was my first QRP rig, um, which does about uh, up to 10 watts SSB and CW. And I consider that an almost no sort of kit. Um, I got this on the air, did my first POTA activation with it, my first successful. And by the way, four unsuccessful ones before that because I couldn't make any contacts. It's really hard to get into QRP if uh, this is the first thing you do after either just getting your license or after a long break, because uh, it's a little bit harder uh, to make contacts if you're not really knowing what you're doing. Um, and then I moved on to another kit, um, the slot bucket. Um, it's SSB, hence the name, but also does CW. This was a 20 meter version, uh, again, five watts. This is designed by Steve Weber, KD1JV. Uh, and the rigs that you may know that were designed by him are the mountain toppers, which are pretty popular soda summits on the air uh, rigs. Some of them uh, CW only, others as a and CW. In this case, uh, this was my first big experience with SMD parts. Most of the parts here are SMD parts, so tiny parts. And that was a challenge the first time I did it. Um, unlike with the FedEx 40, where my case looks pretty uh, sloppy uh, with the holes not lined up correctly. Here, I tried to do a better job, made a metal case out of sheet metal. And you, on the right, you see the different stages um, of putting this into a case. Um, again, I used that for my first few POTA activations successfully, and it's a great radio. Then along came this guy, Hans Summers, uh, who designed the QCX. And in the lower left corner, you see the original QCX in a nice case from Germany that was designed for it. Uh, by now, there have been three different versions of it. You cannot no longer get the first one, uh, but you can get the QCX plus and you will hear more about that from Bob in a few minutes. Uh, and the QCX mini, which is the one that I have here. It's, in my opinion, the best value in ham radio for 50 bucks, you get this kit. And it comes with its own built in test equipment. So you build this and you have the test equipment to uh, diagnose problems with it, built right into the radio. It has a CW decoder built in. So if your CW is a little bit rusty, you can actually read on the display the CW that you receive. You can also use it as a CW a whisper beacon. And uh, there is a 50 watt amplifier available if five watts is not enough. It comes in different uh, single frequency uh, edition, so you can get the 40 meter, the um, 20, 30, 20, 17 meter, and I think there's a 60 and, a, and an 80. But other people uh, were able to put them on the air uh, up to, I think, six meters, actually. You have to fiddle around a little bit with it and potentially change the circuit a little bit at a preamp and stuff like that. But 
uh, it's a pretty nice um, radio and it works fantastically well. Now here's a little size comparison between my two QCXs. So I have an Altoid tin in the front and everybody probably knows what they look like, what size they are. You see them in the checkout lane at the supermarket. Um, and right behind it is the QCX mini. So it's just a tiny little bit taller than the Altoids 10 and then in the background, the original QCX. The uh, QCX plus is a little big, bigger than the uh, original one. Here is my newly assembled QCX 40 uh, on a PODA activation. So I had just finished it, went to uh, a park and put it on the air with a hamstick on a mag mount on my car. And sure enough, I made contacts with it. So again, proof that a QRP actually works even with a really bad antenna on the top of your car. And you can actually see the, uh, in the display, you can see the decoded Morse code there. So it didn't uh, quite decode my call sign DEK5 KHK. Uh, whenever it doesn't understand something, it just puts the asterisk in there. And then I moved on to something a little bit shinier, a little bit more expensive or a lot more expensive actually. So the KX2, the Allicraft KX2, CW, SSB, and a lot more. Uh, does also do ready and PSK31 without having to attach a keyboard. You do that actually by using the Morse code paddles that are attached to the radio and you read the decoded signal on the display. The KX2 goes up to 12 watts. If you have only the built-in battery, uh, I think it does 10 watts maximum. It can have a built-in ATU, automatic antenna tuner. And uh, with that installed, you can tune up a rod. It, it tunes up anything that you hook it up to. Um, it also has a built-in microphone, which means you can actually use it as an HT. Um, it's a little bit cumbersome to push the transmit button to find that when you have it up to your ear. Um, it does 80 to 10 meters and it's a fantastic receiver. Uh, Elecraft does not make bad receivers. We know that. At least if you've been around the block a few times, you know that an Elecraft receiver is, also top, is always top notch. Here is uh, an SDR uh, QRP radio, the Hermes Light 2. That's also a, an almost no solder kit. So you have to put this together yourself. And uh, as you can see, it, the radio is actually on the right. It does not have a user interface, does not have a display, does not have any buttons. So you need a computer to run it, just like some other more expensive uh, SDR radios, like some of the Flexus, uh, don't come with a display. So I use that with Quisk, but there are other options available. And it plays really well with the Hard Rock 50 uh, amplifier. So if five watts is not enough, then you just turn on the amplifier. The radio tells the amplifier which band it wants to be on and the amplifier then switches to that band. So it's basically hands off the amplifier. You just uh, use the computer screen. And this is what the screen looks like when it's tuned to the 40 meter uh, single segment portion of the band. So you see the waterfall, you see the uh, signal graph at the top, and then you have all the buttons and controls at the bottom. Now there are fancier user interfaces available, but Quisk works pretty well. It's reliable and uh, that's what I use. Now, there are other radios, other QRP radios out there. And at the uh, bottom of the spectrum, you find the Pixie. And I call that a $3 radio. Uh, you can find this 
on uh, eBay, Banggood, AliExpress, Amazon, uh, any site that sells directly from China for between two and 10 bucks. So don't pay 10 bucks for it. Uh, I got mine for three bucks, including shipping. So you may have to shop around a little bit to find the cheapest offer. Um, when you get it, it comes with a 7.023 megahertz crystal, which happens to be in the extra segment of the CW uh, portion of the 40 meter band. So you may have to upgrade to extra before you can use it, but you can also buy a, a different crystal for it and put it into the general band. Um, it does not come with any documentation. So you will have to Google around to find the schematic to put it together. But the circuit is so simple, you can actually understand how it works. And there is a PDF file out there that explains exactly how the schematic, how, how it all works. And that's a really nice way to try to understand the radio. It only has, um, I don't know, 20 to 30 components. So it's really easy to understand what every piece does. And there is uh, this guy out there, K6ARK, who does soda activations and videos, YouTube videos about his activations. He took this design and created a micro pixie version of it based on all SMD parts. And I'm linking to the YouTube video here where he describes that. There are two other cheap Chinese kits available. Uh, one is called the Frog Sound and the other one, the 49er. Um, the Frog Sound kit, I think, is around 15 bucks. The 49er might be eight or nine bucks. They are a little bit uh, easier to use on the air because they, for example, have the side tone for CW, which the Pixie does not have. Uh, so if, if you want to get into QRP kit building uh, on your own without too much um, money involved, that's a great way to get started. You don't end up with a great radio. If you want a great radio, go with the QCX. Uh, but again, three bucks, that's less than what you would pay for a coffee at Starbucks. So getting on the air with QRP, uh, how do we do this? You can buy a radio. You can buy an Elecraft KX2, KX3, or any of the other options out there. You can build it by taking uh, a kit, either a pre-assembled one, where you just have to connect a few wires and you get going like the, uh, the, the bit X40 that I had, which by the way, is no longer available. It got replaced by something now called the micro bit X, which is a better radio. Uh, it's multi-band, not just 40 meters. Um, or you can put all the parts on the circuit board yourself, sort of them, and build it uh, from the ground up. If you want a uh, slightly more challenging project, you can use a design from a book or a magazine and then source your own board and parts. Or if you want to up the challenge even more, you can design the radio and build it from scratch. And that is really the best way to understand what radio uh, does and how it works. And the way this uh, would work is you would probably take 10 different designs from books and magazines and then pick and choose components and say, okay, um, the, the oscillator I want to use from this project, the mixer I want to use from that project, the AF amplifier from that project, and so on. And then uh, just pick and choose and try different parts and uh, see whether one module works better than another and so on. So this is a great way to learn about uh, the guts of your radio. The biggest advantage of building your own radio for QRP is that with QRP power levels, the designs can be relatively simple. So you, you are not dealing with thousands of parts, and uh, it's also much easier to understand what's going on. So if you wanna do that, if you wanna build your own, uh, my recommendation is to start with a kit from a 
sort with a good track record. And based on my experience, I would go with the QZX. Uh, now, it is a CW only, Rick, and you would have to learn CW, but we have a program for that. And Tim can tell you all about it. Then once you have some building experience, you can move on to more advanced projects. Antennas, um, anything that works at QRO levels or the work at QRP levels. Now, because we don't have much power to spare, the antenna should be as efficient as possible. But as I've explained before with the hamstick example, even a compromise antenna works. It's all about propagation. And whenever you get on the air, regardless of how bad your antenna is, your signal will travel somewhere. The question just is somebody at that point where they say wrong to listen for you. By a more efficient antenna, uh, you have a better chance of uh, getting to areas where there's actually somebody with the radio who can tune to your frequency. Uh, yeah, some antennas actually make you operate QRP, even though you're putting QRP uh, or power into the antenna. What comes out of the antenna may not be a lot more signal than if you would start out with QRP power uh, from the radio into a highly efficient antenna. So these are the antennas that I've used with my QRP uh, activations. The three band base loaded vertical uh, on an eBay 13, uh, 17 foot fishing pole based on a design by N2CX Joe Everhart. Uh, and he originally published that design in QRP quarterly, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. And I'm linking to a commercial version of that design here. It works on 40, 30 and 20 meters. So if you have a couple of QRP single band radios, uh, that would be a great way to match an antenna to those radios. Then hamsticks with a mag mount on a car. I have the hamsticks of 40 and 20 meters. Just the hamstick does not work very well, at least not when, when it's not bonded to the car. So a mag mount does not have the bonding to the car. And that means that uh, you your ground connection, your RF ground connection, oops, what happened? Ghosts in the machine. Um, your RF ground connection is not very good, um, which me means your antenna will not be very efficient. And I uh, fix that by using one or two 33 foot counterpoises that I clip on my mag mount. And with that set up, uh, I, have no problems making contacts. Now, when you do this with QRO power, uh, there is a chance of getting RF burns on your uh, all metal Morse code key. Uh, and yes, I know what I'm talking about because I've suffered from that. Uh, so a common mode joke will avoid that. Then I have the Wolf River coil with a 17 foot whip. And I use that with three to six 33 feet radials. And if you've ever seen me at any of the uh, RARA operating events, that's probably what I was using. It's a really good antenna, easy to use, easy to put up. And if you don't have anything uh, to hang your antenna off, uh, it's self-supporting. So a great way to get on the air. My current number one antenna is 30 feet of wire on a 31 foot check kite pole. And these are poles, fiberglass poles that are usually used for uh, kite flying. And when you go to the website, they actually sell these kites, but they also sell the poles. And I use a drive on flagpole stand to mount that. So one wiggle of my car goes on that stand and then the, the pole goes into the stand and then I just hang that wire from that uh, fiberglass pole. I use a nine to one on on and a common mode choke. And this setup, it, it, it's basically a random wire antenna. It requires an antenna tuner. But with that, uh, the setup is really quick and easy and um, 
because you have almost twice as much metal in the air as with the Wolf River coil, uh, it is also more efficient. And then with my KX2, um, when you looked at the, pic the first picture that I showed you from the Florida activation, I used 40 feet, four, no, 54 feet of random wire with a 54 foot counterpoise uh, connected directly to the K KX2. Usually you would use uh, the 9 to 1 Anon with that kind of antenna, but the antenna tuner in the KX2 is so good, it just tunes it up without any problems. And I have a six meter fiberglass pole that goes with that, that actually collapses down to a size that fits into a carry-on suitcase. So easy to travel with, and um, you have a QRP station that you can get uh, take with you, regardless of whether you have to fly or just drive to an activation site. Power, uh, I use lithium, uh, ion phosphate batteries, LIFEPO4. These are not lithium ion batteries, the ones that tend to explode when you mistreat them. These are pretty uh, tame and they are hard to, uh, to ignite. And when they do ignite, they burn a lot slower than the more dangerous kind of lithium ion batteries. I have bio -NO batteries. Um, they make batteries in all sorts of sizes. Um, I have the smaller ones. They're not cheap, but they're high quality made in the US and they have exceptional customer service. They work well with solar panels and charge controllers from the same company. And um, I have the 12 amp hour and the three amp hour flavor of it. Then the Mayadi, um, it's a cheap kit on the block. It's something that you get on Amazon. Uh, a lot cheaper, like you pay half of what you would pay for the bio -endo and get twice the amp hour, twice the capacity. Uh, but there is no customer service. And if something goes wrong, then you have nobody to complain to. Now, these batteries do require uh, a charger that is specifically designed for that chemistry. And um, you either buy that from BioNO or these batteries are also pretty popular with uh, remote controlled airplanes, cars, boats. So the, the RC community has a lot of chargers available that might be a little bit cheaper than if you go uh, with something that was specifically designed for ham radio. What is the charger you show in your picture there with the- that is, that is a charger that is used a lot by the RC community. And it does charge a lot of different battery chemistries. So you can do your lead acid, you can do your uh, uh, NICATs, your nickel metal hybrid, uh, different flavors of lithium batteries and so on. So uh, you can program it, you tell it what, chemistry you have, how many cells um, in a series, and then it just charges it. Is that, can you use it with the bio -NO? Yep, I can. Okay. The reason I ask is I'm doing Roger's estate and I came across that thing and I didn't know what the heck it was for. Okay. Yeah. It charges all sorts of uh, battery chemistries. Thank you. And I can talk to you offline about that. Um, I may still have the manual around somewhere and can point you to how much it is and where you would buy it new if you need to find out how much its value is. Thank you. Okay, resources for QRP. Um, mailing lists, there are a few mailing lists out there that have uh, discussions about QRP, specifically about QRP. There was an old one, QRP Tech, uh, that has 15 years of technical information but is now defunct. It got closed down a couple of years ago. Uh, the archive is still available. Now, one thing that they did was uh, for, I think it was the 20th anniversary of the NorCal 40A, which was the successor to the forecast, um, NC40. They did a refresh of that project and did a, uh, a printed circuit board design and gave you some information about how to source the parts. 
So that's a great way to get into this old tech uh, with QRP if you want to recreate a QRP rig from the past, that's a great way to do it. And if you really want to do that, I still have, I think, four printed circuit boards left because I also built that. So if you want a blank circuit board, source your own parts, get in touch with me. I'll gladly hand that board over to you if you do something with it. The successor of this group is QRP Tech. Um, I have the link there. The QRPL mailing list. Uh, has been around for a long time. So if you want to learn more about QRP, subscribe to these lists and just listen in for a while. The QRP Amateur Radio Club International, QRP ARCI, website is linked here, has a magazine, the QRP Quarterly. I don't know whether you can see that. Um, I can show you that again once I stop sharing my screen. Um, comes out four times a year. They also organize the FGIM Four Days in May, which is a QRP conference um, around Dayton. So you go to the ham mansion, you travel a little bit earlier, arrive a little bit earlier, you, you go to FGIM and you meet all the uh, QRP uh, people worldwide. I've had breakfast with Hans Summers, uh, the designer of the QCX twice there. So he's a great guy, really nice to talk to him. Um, they also have the QRP Hall of Fame. So if you become one of those people who are really important to the QRP community, they may actually induct you into the Hall of Fame. Then there's the G QRP Club, the British QRP Club. Uh, they have Sprat Magazine comes also four times a year, usually full with information about mm -hmm. building stuff. The North American QRP CW Club, if you wanna go into QRP NCW, that's your resource. This year, FTIM is virtual. Uh, the event is held on Saturday, May 22nd. Registration fee is 10 bucks, and here is a list of the speakers. So you see Hans Summers is on the list. He's talking about extreme QRP at 30, 35,000 feet. There's a T missing. Um, and I assume he's talking about balloon tracking. So um, talked about the bit X40 at the beginning. Farhan is on the list as well. He's talking about the S bit X uh, successor to, I assume, the micro bit X, and he says it's an open source SDR that you can hack. So um, I'm already signed up. Um, I've been to the actual FTIM two years ago with great fun. If QRP is your thing, that is something to consider when you go to Dayton. Just travel a couple of days early and meet a great bunch of people there. So again, okay. why QRP? It's portable, lower power usually means cheaper, not always, uh, lower RF exposure, less chance to fry your brain, lower risk of causing interference. And if you've already done everything else, it's a new challenge. Um, requires you to be a good listener, know when to call, and you get a lot more knowledgeable about propagation because you will learn how to use propagation to your advantage. If you use full uh, power all the time, you don't care about propagation. You will make your own propagation. For QRP, you need to know how it all works. It works most of the time. Sometimes it can be a bit frustrating, but again, that's the price you pay for doing something that's a little bit harder. If you want to try QRP and you don't have a dedicated QRP radio, just turn down the power knob on your radio. Most radios allow you to go down to five watts and give it a try without any additional investment. A good way to start is get involved with a QRP contest because then everybody expects you to have a weak signal and you are not fighting the bit guns, trying to break a pileup with just five watts. Um, 
if you are playing in a QRP contest, everybody is playing by the same rule and nobody's signal is really strong. So everybody expects you to be weak as well. Speaking of busting pileups with uh, QRP, a couple of weeks ago, I was using my, let's go back here, my Hermes light. Uh, problem with the amplifier is it doesn't do 60 meters. So when I want to work on 60 meters, I have to turn off the amplifier and then just have a five watt signal. So I was doing that, had the amplifier turned off and wasn't realizing that. And then I was uh, hunting some Poda parks and I was answering a call from a guy in Maryland, I think, and he had a big pileup going. Um, I called him, got a five nine signal report from him and then I realized my amplifier was off. So I was running five watts. So that shows you QRP really works even if you don't want to actually use it uh, if it was just a lucky accident. So um, that is it. That was my presentation and I am stopping my screen sharing now. So now you should be able to see my QRP quarterly, the magazine from the uh, ARCI spread. And of course, there are a lot of books out there about QRP. Uh, this is a collection of uh, QST and uh, QEX articles about QRP in book form. So th if this is something that you want to get into, build your own rigs, then uh, there is a lot of information out there. And I don't know, how do we want to handle this with questions? Do we want to uh, answer questions now? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions for Carl Heinz? Uh, you can uh, open your mic and ask him now. Don't everybody talk at once. Okay, right. nobody has any uh, questions. I'll, uh, I'll throw one out, Carl Heinz. What is your favorite radio out of the QRP rigs that you have? Uh, the KX2. <laughs> it's just, just based on the receiver quality. Uh, it's it's fantastic. And the second is the QZX. Uh, its receiver is almost as good as the KX2. By the way, I saw Dave Thompson taking a picture of his CR, his screen there. Uh, Dave, uh, th this video will be on our website eventually. And also, I believe uh, Carl Heinz will submit his slides, won't you, Carl yep. Heinz? Yep. Thank you. So uh, on the Ra Ra website under academies, uh, you'll find uh, these archives. So you don't have to take a picture of your screen there, David. <laughs> Thank you. I also well, will have... try and get that the uh, slides up right away. Go ahead, Dave Crawford. Yeah, Carl, I have a quick question of the event in May. Uh, I guess it's re replacing the date. What was the date for that? Uh, uh, May 22nd. May 22nd. Thank you. Right. You have so to register. Usually, go, ahead. go ahead, Tim. I said you have to register through education. We have a limited number of spots. So unless you take the time, education at rochesterham.org. Uh, I have limited uh, spots that we can do at the park. And uh, we're going to have QRP. We may have higher power, too, because we do have AC there. <clears throat> I had two quick questions. Um, so Carl Heinz, I, I missed um, when you, you were talking about, I think um, going back to the antennas, uh, you had talked about um, uh, using RF choke. Yep. And I, I didn't know if, if that was primarily for, for certain kinds of antennas or if that's something that when you're, you're operating QRP, you use pretty much across the board. Actually, um... When you operate QRP, uh, it's not that important. It's more important okay. with QRO to keep RF energy from reaching your radio and your microphone and your key and anything else metal around your radio. That's when you end up with those painful RF burns. Um, I use an RF choke uh, anytime I have an antenna that's not symmetrical. So when you have a dipole, chances are you don't need one because the, the antenna will make sure that uh, you don't have too much RF power going back on the antenna. Now, in general, it's a good idea to use one all the time, 
because genes are, even if you have a, a really well-balanced antenna, it's not 100% balanced and there might be some RF that's coming back. Um, and that will interfere with, uh, in my case, around my shack, my mouse does not like it when there's uh, RF in the shack, it goes crazy. So by using an RF choke, uh, you can avoid that. Uh, you avoid the RF burns and a whole bunch of other problems. So I, I just have it in my in my go box. Uh, it's part of my antenna setup and it always goes in. Okay. The other quick question I had was for a lot of the, the portable setups with, with the QRP, Riggs, you, you shared, do you need to, uh, whether it's for performance or safety, ground those rigs at all? No, um, no. no? Okay. There are two different kinds of grounds you work with in Wayu. One is an RF ground, and that is where the RF choke comes in. You use a counterpoise or a balanced antenna, uh, and that takes care of that. The other ground is a safety ground. And if you are battery operated, and you take your antenna down before the lightning actually has a chance to hit it, uh, you don't need that safety ground. Okay. Carl, I have a question for you. Um, you haven't mentioned anything about Yesu or ICOM. They, they both make URP rigs. You I think... was just talking about my rigs. Uh, yes, okay. there are other companies out there and Yesu just, uh, no. ICOM just came out with a 705, mm. uh, which everybody wanted. I, I, I didn't line up to buy one. Um, I'm more than happy with my KX2. So yeah, there are a lot of other radios out there that I don't have any first-hand experience with, and they are probably all good radios. So all I can talk about is the radios that I've actually uh, operated with. Understood, thank you. Okay, right. is it time for Bob to take over? I guess it is. Okay. Uh, here we go. Screen is my screen. Hey, can you, everybody hear me okay? Yes. I hope. Good. Um, I'm going to give a slightly different uh, take on uh, QRP, of course, if I can you know, share. There we go. Share, I think. Good. Great. Uh, I'm going to give a slightly uh, uh, different take on what Carl did. Uh, and I think that's, it's going to be interesting to see how everybody's uh, uh, come because everybody has a different uh, 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 view of the way, what QRP is. Uh, I'm going to give mine. Uh, I've been on, uh, doing QRP for uh, quite a while now. And uh, so we'll be going back uh, quite, quite a bit. Uh, start out with what is QRP? Uh, QRP, of course, I'm, people who know me know I'm a CW guy, so I only said... Uh, for uh, CW, QRP is five watts of RF power. As is pointed out, for Cone, it's 10 watts. Uh, it can be any mode, uh, but traditionally it's been, uh, 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 it's been CW or digital modes. Uh, let me see if I can make this smaller here. There, that was interfering with what I could see on my slide. Um, uh, it's, traditionally it's been CW, but if you don't want to learn CW, you know, Whisper and some of the others will work fine on QRP, and that might be a way you want to go. Uh, I tend to avoid phone to avoid frustrations, but we'll go get to more of that in a minute. Uh, as uh, Heinz said, uh, Carl said, I should say, uh, uh, the uh, QRP can be any, Q QRP can be any, use any antenna, but if you've got a great antenna, it's so much the better. The better the antenna, the better off you'll do. And QRP can be any band, but some bands are better than others. It all depends on the provocation. I kind of like 40 meters, 20 meters is pretty good and 80 meters is pretty good. And uh, I've never tried 60 meters, but apparently that that also, uh, it really do, does any band, but what you want is a band that's going to be opened a lot. Okay, uh, why do I like QRP? Well, uh, you can see in the background on my uh, uh, image today, you will see uh, when I, uh, if you're looking at my image, you'll see an amplifier right here, a Dentron uh 800 watt amplifier and uh after doing that or even with a 100 watt, watt transceiver you want something a little bit more challenging and qrp is just that uh carl talked about the advantages of q 
QRP. It's smaller, cheaper, certainly much more powerful uh, and less complex. But also these days, it's pretty high performance. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Dave Birnbaum, K2LYV, is down in Tampa, Florida, uh, has a QCX. And he did a little test with his against his ICOM uh, uh, 7300, I guess it was. And uh, it really compares quite favorably. Uh, it's got a nice CW filter on it now. There's uh, uh, not much you really give up. Uh, the final thing that uh, I like, I really like about QRP is, especially if you're just doing it without a contest or anything, and you just happen to catch somebody who doesn't know your QRP, it gives you, say, a, he's got a strong signal, he's 599, it gives you maybe a 579, uh, and you tell him you're only running three watts or five watts or whatever, there's a certain D wids factor to that. And it kind of, you know, you kind of smile a little bit when the other guy says, wow, you're only running three watts or five watts or whatever. So that uh, QRP is, it's really, it's, it's a challenge and it's a lot of fun. Okay, now a little bit about why I use CW uh, or, or why you should use CW or digital for QRP. This is a screenshot from my big radio, my flex radio. And the thing that I want you to see is that this first is that uh, it's 10 kilohertz wide spectrum you're looking at, part of the spectrum. I assume that everybody's fairly familiar with the waterfall down below. And what you can see is with a phone signal, this is an SSB single sideband signal on 40 meters. And what you can see down the bottom is it's spread out pretty far. And uh, your 100 watts or 1,000 watts or for QRP, 10 watts is spread over two and a half kilohertz of the, of the signal or so. If you go to CW or digital, this is uh, digital with the same scale, same 10 kilohertz scale. And look, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, maybe about 10 signals on there. You can see the different kinds of uh, modulation down here, all in less space than the, uh, uh, the, the spectrum of the, the less of the spectrum than the SSB signal took up. And again, you know, the strength of your signal is, uh, is uh, the peak, peak strength of your signal is going to be determined by how much power you're running, but also how much bandwidth. When you cut the bandwidth down by a couple of orders of magnitude, the signal strength, the peak signal strength goes up. What you're trying to do is what counts is, here's the background noise down here. And to be heard, you've got to be above the background noise, assuming there's no QRM. And uh, uh, these signals all get well above the background noise. Of course, the best, best signal you can have is, ta-da, CW because now it's all your signal is being concentrated on just one, one point. And uh, this is why I like CW. Of course, there's a minor problem that if you don't know CW, it's quite an investment in time to learn it. But nonetheless, I think it's uh, well worthwhile. Uh, this is just a quick screen to say from SSB, CW, and digital, which mode would you take? Well. CW or digital clearly, if you want to be less frustrated. That's not to say that you can't make contacts on phone. I'm going to uh, show one of the contacts that one of the very interesting contacts that I did have was phone or uh, QRP. Okay, I love another way of showing what Carl uh, showed you. So I'll do it, go over it quickly, but this is with S meters showing what your signal, the signal can be weak, but you can still be heard. Uh, the same kind of 6 dB per uh, S unit that Carl talked about, and I thought it explained it beautifully. But over here on this side, when the conditions are really good and you hear those 30 over nine stations with a QRP stiff of 1500 watts and a really good antenna, you'll be down, if you only have a wire antenna and five watts, you're gonna be down about to S9, about, uh, oh, what is it? Uh, well, I, what is it, 30 dB or whatever else? can't figure it out in my head real quickly, but an S30 over nine signal becomes S9. So conditions are really hot. Your signal will be reasonably strong as long as you're not being QRM, as long as you're not being interfered with by some other, by, by another station. Now, when conditions are less strong, less good, and the DX station is running S9 or the, the, the strong station is running, the QRM station is running S9, 1500 watts in a Yagi, you'll only be down around S3 or S4. Now remember that the noise level for many of us is around S3. So now it's getting a little bit iffy. So the conditions are very important in knowing whether you're going to be heard or not. Okay, change, change 
here's a little bit. I think this is something you're not gonna hear from anybody else. Uh, I've been a ham since 1958 and QRP, I wasn't aware that QRP was 100 watts uh, a couple of years ago, but as of 50 or 60 years ago, QRP was still five watts for CW. And at that time, uh, first I didn't have a camera, so I don't have any pictures of my rig. So I went out and got something similar. My rig was, the receiver was an HQ100. That I still got downstairs in the basement. We're trying to get it refurbished. And I had a homebrew 813, 300 watt uh, homebrew rig that I uh, bought from uh, a, a fellow who, who uh, uh, made it. And uh, that, that was after I had my DX40. This ran about 300 watts, as I said, an 813. I still got the 813, but I don't have anything else of it. And an external VFO, which looked very similar to this. And um, that's the way rigs were. And in order to do QRP then, there was no going out. You, could, you couldn't travel out to the uh, country and do uh, uh, QRP uh, from parks on the air, anything like that. It's much more difficult. Instead, most people did QRP from their own uh, home stations. And what I did was I took my HQ100 and I went in and I pulled off the uh, B plus and I pulled off the AC for the filaments. And I took my VFO and used it as a driver. And I built a little one tube transmitter. Whoop, let's go back to that. One tube transmitter that looked very similar to this. It was a 6CL6 sitting on a mini box. It had a pie network like this has. Uh, it was uh, put under, I managed to fit it into the mini, mini box and it had five watts in and three and a half watts out. Cool, but that's all I wanted. What I wanted was a key buffer and uh, use a 6CL6. And in the mid 60s, uh, 64, 65 and 66, when I was in college, I came home and I put it on the air and the result was, here, these are just some of the contacts. I've still got my logbook, and these are some of the contacts that I made with it, uh, running uh, three watts, three and a half watts. And this is where, back then, you really got a gee whiz. Gee, you're only one on three watts. This was all on 40 meters, by the way. And you can see the contacts and the dates uh, that I used. I got as far away as uh, uh, Gary, Indiana, and uh, Western uh, Virginia, and into uh, uh, into Massachusetts and that kind of thing. So you can, I mean, so the QRP has been around for quite a while. Okay, now there's another aspect of QRP that I wish I'd done, but I didn't have the, I, I really should have tried it. Occasionally I've worked a lot of stations on the air and some of them have been running QRP. And these are some of the stations that I worked. I was not running QRP, but these guys were. And uh, I've worked Alaska, guy was running five watts. Uh, France, Paris, France, three watts, uh, Peru, five watts, and uh, the, um, the I'd say the, the, uh, my favorite contact of all was uh, Sweden, uh, outside of uh, 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 Sweden, and uh, he was running two watts and a ground plane antenna on 15 meters in 1986, and uh, he was 579, and uh, I, I mean, I, I, I got 579, and he was running 549, which is just about what you'd expect from my station versus his station. But talk about what QRP can do. Try two watts to Stockholm, Sweden and 549 in, in uh, 1986. Uh, just for the heck of it, when I was preparing this presentation, I looked him up and he's still running QRP and uh, uh, he's still on the air. This is, this is the guy, Pear, and there's are talking outside of uh, Stockholm, Sweden. And in case you think it was a hello, goodbye, Cusa, what was not? I talked to him for 20 minutes. Okay, QRP today. All right, we've already uh, uh, talked a lot about uh, what the QCX Plus, uh, QCX Plus is. Uh, you will see uh, more on the QCX Mini, and you've already seen on the original QCX. Uh, I bought this when the, uh, this uh, about a year ago, a little, little less than a year ago, when uh, the CAW group all got together and all bought, the, bought these things. I put mine together. Uh, I won't go over the features because you all are aware of them. Uh, but uh, one of the things I'll say about building this kit is that uh, if you can solder, it's reasonably straightforward. If you put it together when you're asleep, it doesn't work very well, as in I, I swapped a couple of pots, uh, potentiometers, and in replacing them, uh, I had to do a little bit of circuit board cleanup, thanks, thanks to my uh, sleepiness. 
So if you take your time and you're aware, uh, you can put it together, uh, no problem. I didn't really have any problem getting it to work. And I'd say that it's a very solid unit. I've got it right here. And uh, I'm looking forward to using it to uh, go talk with the grandkids. Uh, I mean, when I'm visiting the grandkids, to put amateur radio on the air for, for them and to play with it. Okay, one thing about QCX though is, a uh, question that I have for everybody is, see the display's on, where are the wires? And there are no wires because I've put a battery in it. And I wanna show a little bit about what's involved in doing that. And if anybody uh, wants to do it for their own QCX, I can give you more detail. I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail now though for it. First thing is this is what this thing looks like with the cover off, looking at it from the back. And what you see is the QCX has got a, uh, a circuit board that's fairly fairly low profile. Most of the top is empty. Uh, they say so that you, uh, you can modify it if you wish, uh, or they can also sell, they also sell what amounts to a card that's uh, 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 a circuit card that's uh, similar to the um, uh, Arduino, um, uh, gee, I'm, words are escaping me today, but uh, Ar Arduino uh, uh, kits that uh, you put, uh, uh, put a uh, electronics on top of the uh, top of the Arduino. In this case, what I've done is I've taken four lithium-ion batteries, uh, 1860 batteries. Uh, I use them because they're big. They have a fairly high capacity, 3,500 milliamp hours, and they have the right voltage that four of them will power a uh, QCX. Actually, more than power a QCX. And uh, what I've done is I put up a power. Uh, there's a switch on here that selects the battery, or whether you want to charge straight through. And uh, just for detail, you'll see that there's a saw, so you can see the plexiglass plate that I mounted everything on rather than going to uh, uh, buy the uh, circuit card extender. A uh, little bit about the way the circuit works and how I got it. Uh, this is a high level view of the circuit. And what it shows is it's got a double pole, double throw switch, these two things here. And there's two paths, either it goes from the power supply or battery charger, depending on which one you pick goes with the bed where the uh, power supply goes down this route into the uh, QCX. And if you throw the switch uh, and you want to charge the battery, the battery charging circuit goes from here through here and it charges the battery. Or if you disconnect the battery and just have the switch in the battery position, the battery discharges down this path down into the QCX. So it, uh, it works quite well. A little bit more about a little bit more about the uh, power supply and charger. Uh, what I did was you can find almost anything online, and I found a uh, article by a guy that wanted to build a charger and replace the batteries on his power drill, uh, a guy in uh, Munich, Germany. And uh, I sent uh, uh, I tried the circuit, and uh, this is basically it. It's a very simple. Uh, what it does is it makes use of if you happen to have a old laptop, which I did, and I think a lot of us do with a, uh, uh, a charger on it, um, you can take that charger and uh, it goes, its input is right here and here. And what he does is he has a microprocessor and to apply, supply the microprocessor, first he's got a power supply for the, to drop the 13, 19 volts down to five volts for the uh, Arduino Pro Mini down here. Uh, over here, he's got some control circuitry and here he's got a resistor that senses the current into the microprocessor. The microprocessor sends a signal via this line out to the, uh, uh, the control transistor that controls the charging rate. And uh, it charges your uh, battery quite nicely in a couple of hours. Uh, and then you unplug it. Uh, one other thing that you have to add to it is there's a something called the battery protection board. Uh, which is a uh, circuit that makes sure that all four cells charge at the same rate so that you don't overcharge one or the other. This is very small and it actually fits underneath the battery compartment. And uh, that's essentially it. Um, the thing that I would uh, point out is that, uh, or the one thing that I'd add is that uh, I thought that after I finished, I'd send the guy an email, let him thank him and let him know what I use it for. And he wrote back and said, you know, I'm a ham. I said, what a surprise. He's talking about charging a drill. And uh, we've been trying, but that had it been successful. He's a relatively new ham and he doesn't have very uh, good CW skills yet. 
so I'd love to have a contact with him because he says he likes to chase the X and his farthest contact at that time was something like uh, the Western, uh, Western Russia. So I told him I'd give him some real DX and I'm still hoping that I'm gonna do that. This is what the uh, final kit looks like or final charge looks like. You've got the uh, charger, you've got the, uh, wall, the wall ward, you've got the charging control circuitry and you've got the QCX. A few more pictures that I'm gonna go over just quickly. That's what the charging control circuit looks like. I just, uh, uh, for, for just to show you what it does, what it looks like. That's with the uh, uh, with the um, the Arduino um, Pro Mini removed, and then uh, put it all together. This is the back of the uh, QCX, and all I've done was added a switch here, and it's either battery charging position or power supply position. And uh, frankly, uh, if you've got a QCX, I'd really consider QCX Plus. I should say. You really consider doing this because when I need to put the, put the thing up, I don't have to find a battery or power supply. I just plug in the antenna, plug in the um, uh, plug in headphones and a key panel, and uh, I'm good to go. And the battery runs many hours uh, without a charge. If you were going to do parks on the air or something like that, it would work very well. The only uh, caveat that I'd say is that uh, this unit is a little bit uh, heavier. It's about the size of a paperback book, a big paperback book. Uh, a little bit heavier and a little bit bigger than uh, what the QCX uh, Mini is. Let's see. Uh, conventional construction, uh, just drop me out and uh, contact me. Uh, I'm sure you know, should be able to get a hold of me uh, if you want any more details on how it was built. Uh, the kit now, as I said, I want to take this down to my down. We're babysitting for my uh, grandkids uh, in a couple of weeks now that we finally gotten vaccinated for the COVID. And uh, uh, I plan on bringing this thing down to Virginia and operating portable. Uh, Carl emphasizes the importance of, a, of an antenna, of a good antenna. One of the advantages of the QCX is that it only operates on 40 meters. You only need one antenna. And uh, uh, you don't really need a tuner if the antenna is connected correctly. Although the QCX will take up to two to one SWR or even more without any problem at all. I built a little homebrew antenna I'm feeding it with some uh, RG, RG-174 coax, which is very thin stuff, very high loss. It's crummy stuff, but on 40 meters, it's okay. Uh, the QCX, notice that I got the QCX on just to show off. A pair of headphones and a key paddle. It's got a built-in key, key, key paddle. It's got a built-in here, uh, even the translator for a few years, Morse code isn't that good. So that uh, it's really uh, quite something. It's very compact. I'm gonna throw it in the car. Uh, throw it up in a tree, and uh, I expect to have a lot of fun with it in a couple of weeks. Um, this is also mentioned, so we'll do it quickly. I've got uh, two stand standby rigs here, three three rigs here, a flex radio, uh, ICOM 746 Pro, and an ICOM a Kenwood 930, and all three of them can be adjusted down to five watts. So that uh, that's really, if you want to see what QRP is like, uh, you could do it without doing anything other than taking your rig and turning it down and uh, giving it a try. And that would go for trying out digital modes too. And uh, uh, it's a really a good way to get your feet wet. It's also very handy. I take part in the uh, uh, NAQCC sprints. I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Uh, we've talked, uh, uh, Carl, Carl mentioned the North American CW QRP, QRP CW club. And uh, a uh, monthly contest, and uh, I usually try and do out 40 meters and use my Q QCX Plus, but uh, a couple of times in the last uh, six months, uh, 40 meters has been absolutely abysmal. And so uh, after not being able to make any contacts on 40 meters, I've uh, simply taken the uh, flex radio, cranked it down and gone down to 80 meters and worked the contest that way. It's a great way to get your feet wet without doing anything, no adjustment at all, just tune it down and try it out. Uh, I mentioned just now the NAQCC monthly sprints. Uh, very much in favor of that because two things. First is because of the way the contest is organized, with, it encourages people to use uh, hand keys. Because it encourages people to use hand keys, just about everybody on there is using very slow CW. I'm talking about five words a minute, 10 words a minute. And, uh, and it's also a very uh, low key kind of a contest. It goes every month, they've got a lot of rewards. Nobody gets excited, everybody's patient. 
and uh, a lot of fun and a lot of a good way to get into QRP and good grief in one evening. It runs from 8.30 in the evening until uh, 10.30 in the evening local time, usually about, uh, um, uh, about 8.30, uh, midweek, about mid middle of the month as they come up. You can look it up online when the exact next one is. Great contest and uh, a lot of fun. Five watts or less. Here's a map of, this was, this was a particularly good one. This was in September. These were the contacts I made in uh, uh, two and uh, two hours. And including uh, my longest so far QRP to QRP was out to the West Coast, out to Oregon. And you can see, if I did this in two hours with my antenna is a wire antenna, it's an 80 meter off center fed dipole tuned up on 40 meters. You know, if you could do that, you get the idea that it's, it's not that hard. It's, it's, and gee, power less than a nightlight. I mean, what's not to love about QRP? Sorry, I'm getting excited here. Uh, for my most memorable QSO, which was something that uh, was just suggested when we put the slides together, you may hear this from everybody. Um, and by the way, you're going to hear a really good one from Ned. I won't, I won't tell you any more than that. But my most memorable one was after I built the QCX and I got the antenna going, I wanted to see how it did. I literally threw it up, threw the antenna up in the, up in the tree in the front yard, ran the uh, 174 coax in the front door uh, to the uh, dining room and operated from the dining room table. And uh, this guy was calling CQ and I answered him. It turns out he's a college student uh, in Rochester, Minnesota. So it was Rochester to Rochester. Talked to him for about half an hour uh, using that 40 meter, 40 meter in, uh, inverted. Uh, the dipole was hooked up as an inverted V because I only wanted to put, I didn't want to put it all up in a tree. It was easier to just run it, run the, run, it, run the sides down. Young Ham doing CW, great. And uh, as a college student and uh, just a very enjoyable uh, uh, QSO. He gave me a 599. I'm not sure he was being honest. He was actually a 559 with me, but my, my, uh, uh, my background noise here is about S3. So five, five, you know, S5, which is what he was, uh, was no problem. He, uh, no problem with the QSO, easy, a lot of fun. Everybody getting the QRP. I haven't said that already. All right. Uh, rules for the happy QRP here. Uh, this is uh, just a couple of things, a couple of hints for people when you're, when you're, when you're uh, trying it out. First is, the most important thing is not to be frustrated. Know when you're wasting time. If you get on the air and there are a couple of stations, you know they're big guns, 1500 watts, uh, you know, gain antenna, and they're running S5 and your noise level's S3, don't bother. Go find another band, do something else, because you're not going to work anybody. Uh, also, it's good to know where the QRPers hang out. It's usually kind of just something above for CW, it's something above the very bottom of the band. Uh, 705, 7, uh, uh, 703, 705, 706, between the very bottom of the band up to where you find the digital folks. And to avoid frustration, first, it's better to answer stations than to call CQ, especially if there's no contest on. Uh, for the reasons that I talked about at the very beginning, where the, you see that you really need more power for phone, don't uh, avoid the phone, phone modes. And uh, I forgot to mention when I showed you my DX, the station that I talked to in Peru was running five watts on phone. So you can do it. Uh, I was running 100 watts, of course, at the time, but uh, it can be done. Uh, don't try and compete with the high power stations because you're not going to, uh, it's not going to work. Uh, you're just not going to, you're just going to be frustrated. Use provocation. If you find, if the band is wide open, as we saw from the very beginning, when you're running, when the QRP stations, run, when the regular stations, the high power stations are running 20 and 30 over nine, you are going to be well above the noise floor. That means it's good, good propagation. Your signal is going to be running S8, S9, well above most people's noise floors. Propagation will be good. You'll have a good time. And finally, take part in, uh, take part in, let me go back to this, take part in, in uh, uh, QR, in, uh, in uh, there we go. Sorry. We take part in uh, something like the NAQCC contest because that makes it uh, makes it easy. Another good time to use QRP is surprisingly field day, because it turns out that uh, 
the, there's a lot of activity in the band, but it's pretty well spread out, particularly on the CW band, and uh, you'll have good luck there. Finally, we hope that everybody will try QRP. It's a unique experience, and it's a great way of, I call it an operating mode. It's not really, a, it's not really an operating mode, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a great aspect of the hobby. It's something that I think you'll enjoy. And so that, uh, see whether there are any questions, and then uh, we turn it over to Ned. Questions, anyone? Open your mic, shout out. Hey, Bob, you mentioned your first uh, QRP rig with the Pento there. Did you ever do anything with like the 1S5 or any of the low voltage tubes? Uh, no, I didn't. I'm not even sure. I, I, of course, I was a teenager then. You know, I mean, just barely, I was in college, I guess, but I uh, wasn't aware of it. Were there, were, were there, the Solid State wasn't really around yet. Uh, no, there was, was the a series of about, uh, I think there was about six or seven tubes that were used for the five tube AM radios that were all 1.5 volt filaments with 22 volt B plus. Oh, oh so that's what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, no, I didn't. I wasn't, a, no, I, I wouldn't have been, it was kind of a, it was almost the lark. Uh, it was, yeah, yeah I had kind of the 6L6 with. from my DX40 and uh, I had a mini box and I had a tin socket and I had the handbook and why not? You know, it was one of those things. Okay. I'll make a, Very... a comment if I could uh, about the oh. high powered stations. While I agree with uh... Todd, your the... microphone is Todd. extremely low. Can't hear you. I'll, I'll go to the chat. Okay, go to the chat. <laughs> it's going to put it in chat for everyone. Okay. Can you do CW? <laughs> yeah. 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 Send it in Morris. Todd's, Todd's good at Morris. I've talked to him on the air. So I said, everybody that knows me knows that I love CW, but, I, but I'm but i really open to, you know, I mean, digital's fine, you know, and even phone works, you know, I'm not that dogmatic. All right. Well, uh, Todd's typing there. Uh, any uh, other questions for uh, Bob or Cars? Bob, is your battery adapt adaptation for the... Uh, QCX, the thing that is in the rag? Uh, yes. Okay. That's great. right. Good memory. He's one of the younger ones here. <laughs> it was, uh, it was, a, it, it, frankly, it was, a, that was some, some, some projects you do uh, really work out well. Then don't turn out to be a real lot of work and uh, works really well. And uh, the guy that wrote the article was happy to know that I'd done it. And, you know, I mean, it was just, uh, just a pleasure all the way around to do. And it's made made the rig. Uh, I it, not having to lug around a uh, power supply uh, and uh, not having to hook it up. Uh, it's just been great. Okay, let's see. Hi, uh, this is uh, Rich Ka Two VCW. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you clear something up for me? Uh, I know five watts is is a QRP power level for a CW. What is the power level for a single sideband? 10 watts, I think. Carl, is that right? Yes, 10 watts. Okay, good. My ten, That's why my 10 tech Argo 6 is uh, 10 watts. Yeah, and you need it, by the way. <laughs> it's harder to, I would say it's harder to make, let's ask Carl because he's got more experience, but it should be harder to make contacts uh, with uh, 10 watts on yes. SSP than it is 5 watts on CW. Yes, it, it is a lot harder. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I used the uh, 10 tech for about a year and uh, it was uh, frustrating, but it, it worked. And I'm wondering whether anybody's had any experience QRP digital, because my expect, expect, expectation is that digital would work pretty well QRP too. Th that is actually how I started when I got back into the hobby. Uh, I didn't have an antenna. So what I did was I hooked up my rain gutters and I did, my operating position is really close to the rain gutters. So I didn't want to put too much power into them. Uh, so I used five watts on uh, FT8 at the beginning, and then got into PSK31. Um, works extremely well, right. especially FT8, which is uh, a weak signal mode. Even if your signal is weak, somebody will pick you up and pull you out of the noise and work you. Uh, Todd, Todd typed in the uh, chat room that a. A, a comment about uh, high power stations, whether they be local or DX, mm -hmm. give them a shot because 
they not only have uh, a high power, they also have good antennas and good ears. So they may very well pick you out as a QRP, especially if you put QRP after your call sign. I, I've heard that yeah. uh, that they, they will listen for that. The same as if you're uh, doing it uh, mobile or something. If you say mobile, they'll uh, they'll they'll uh, pick you out of the crowd. Yeah, and also that that's when you get the most gee whiz. You know, gee, I'm running a thousand watts here. How much power are you running again? Really? You know, that's I get a kick out of that. You can no problem calling calling a QRO station. None at all. The only thing I'd avoid is pileups, and even pileups. Sometimes you get lucky. But just be prepared to be frustrated. That's all. That that's a question of, of contesting and timing. You have to know when to when to talk. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you know. Sometimes these uh, these pile the stations, particularly DX stations running pile ups, uh, they're not so much interested in in the guys with the uh, multi tens of thousands of dollar rigs. When they hear somebody in their week week so often ask for them and ask everybody to stand by, well they work the week one so that uh, uh, it can be done, but it's just sometimes it's hard to get in with a bedroom. Everybody likes QRP, even the guys running high power like it. I respect it. I don't use it. <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, this is Rich again. I, I've had, I had an experience so that contradicts that. I was on and I, I contacted a guy with on my 10 tech and uh, we had five, at the 10 watts PEP. And it, it was an Italian station. And as soon as I mentioned the word QRP, the guy dropped me like a brick and he wouldn't talk to me. And mm -hmm. uh, incredibly frustrating <laughs> to, for that to happen. And, you know, we were, he gave me an S7 and, you know, he was at least an S9 or 10. He was using a, a Yankee, obviously in a high power. But he, even though he could hear me clearly, as soon as I said QRP, he didn't want any part of me. Really? Wow. Okay. I've yeah, never experienced was, that, I'd have to say. No, that's, not, that's an exception to the rule. But yeah. There are guys out there that won't bother with us. So I avoid saying QRP anymore. <laughs> no, I usually don't tell them until the end of the contact. You know, I mean, when you get into it, I like to rank you a little bit on CW so they don't find out until the third go around what the rig is. You know, rig here is five watts. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, I do the same thing. That's what I do. I wait till the end of the QSO and then say, oh, I'm QRP, by the way. <laughs> and another thing, uh, another great little radio, if you really want to run 100 watts, you know, and then drop it down to five, uh, I have an FT891, and it's not much bigger than a lot of QRP rigs. It is heavy, but it will run on a, you know, a, a, I have a, a 3.5 amp hour uh, lipo battery that I use on it, and it, it'll run for quite a while. So that's an option if you're a little bit afraid uh, of uh, just buying a QRP radio. So uh, any more questions for Carl or for uh, Bob Cars uh, before we move on to Ned? I, I like Bob. Bob, uh, it, it, go ahead. Go ahead, John. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. yeah. Okay. I have a question for Bob, and anyone else can uh, offer their suggestion too. I am a longtime QRP operator, and I have seen many times in the literature people writing, don't ever. Uh, put QRP after your call when you call CQ. I have many, many times, and I've always felt that that has uh, generated contacts for me. So my question is to anybody, how do you feel, and Bob has mentioned it when he identifies his QRP at the end, how do you uh, uh, feel about sending QRP out when you're first looking for a contact uh, by sending a CQ? That's it. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I, I would. I, I. I don't think that it's necessary. You know, I just haven't had that much trouble making contacts that I ever feel that uh, it's worthwhile. I usually save it 
but not on, but I'm not against uh, I don't have any problem with anybody doing it. I hear it on the air all the time. I just have never been frustrated that to that level that I feel I need to do it. Anybody else have a comment? Uh, I'm in the same boat. I'm not doing it. If somebody can hear me, they don't care about whether I'm QRP or not. Uh, they will work me. Okay. I, have a, I have an experience on the other side. Um, I was on 10 meters back in years ago, and I was trying to contact the Vatican through a huge pileup. And I was, I was uh, operating at 5 watts PEP, and I just yelled my call sign a few times, QRP station, QRP station. And all of a sudden, the Vatican guy comes out, all the stations are standing by. If you are a peace station, call again. So in that particular instance, it worked good for me. Right, but that's different. That's not calling CQ. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in that case, I would do that too. And actually, um, what I've done, I, I do a lot of POTA. And some activators also take a break and say, any mobile stations out there, any low power stations. And if there's a big pileup going, and I can't get through with 100 watts, what I will then do is dial down to five watts and then I'm a QRP station. And then I call when I get the chance because I know then I don't have almost no competition. So uh, all of a sudden it gets much easier to get through it. And if they can hear me, they will work me. And can I just uh, get a mic check again? That's better, no, you're good. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to have to sign off for a few minutes. I'm going to be signing back in on uh, on uh, phone. If there's anything anything else comes up, I'll be in as soon as I back as soon as I can. Have a safe trip there, Bob. Thank you. All right, Ned, you're up. I am now unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Well, good morning, everybody. I'll get the share screen here. I'm going to share screen number two. Everybody see that? You got it. OK. And I'm going to take a little different focus. Uh, transceivers and activities, I'm going to focus on the uh, evolution of the trail-friendly radio, which actually uh, folks have been, Carl especially, have been uh, commenting on on his uh, experiences there. And one of the things that's interesting to me was what made this possible? And the answer is uh, uh, the, the integration of the functions available in LSI uh, components. So we'll be talking about that and uh, I'll be interspersing some of my personal activities. Explain what LSI is. We have some very young new hams here. Large scale integration. That's what makes your computer chips, the things that you spend your time on, your telephone, very large scale integration. And that's what's made things possible, especially when they focus on the uh, uh, components that are important. There we go. Now, you, everybody's answered what's QSP or what's QRP rather. And yeah, five watts, 10 watts in that area. Uh, I'm interested in the uh, building your own and operating batteries and getting out in the field and those kinds of experiences. So I'll be, that's be my focus here. But why QRP? And people have mentioned that. One of my analogies is uh, QRP is to QRO as, as sailing is to power boating. You know, why would anybody want to do a sailboat when they got uh, a huge power boat or, or, or a yacht that can sail it go around in. And I think it's just a lot more fun. You're depending on the elements. When you're sailing, you're depending on the wind and the weather and uh, things like that. When you're QRP, you you're, you're want the sunspot activity and uh, propagation to work in your favor. And that, that's the exciting thing. And you never know what's going to happen. And that's what makes it so exciting. And as by example, Bob alluded to this back in 2006 was still running a, a K2 QRP because that was all the power amp hadn't come available yet. And uh, I had a uh, dipole antenna and it was late at night. Band was totally dead. 
I was at near the end of uh, the solar cycle number 23, so propagation wasn't all that good. I, I like 30 meters a lot. Uh, you don't have you don't have high power to contend with. And but that band was dead, and I called CQ, which I don't normally do. And I was on what they call the FIST frequency. That's not quite so popular now, but the FIST organization was uh, not necessarily QRP, but CW. They were promoting CW. So I was on the FITS frequency. And a lot of folks in the FITS uh, organization would come up with their frequencies, which in the, on uh, 30 meters was the 10.118 uh, frequency. And lo and behold, I called once and New Zealand came back to me. And in the course of the conversation, he was running a K2 and a dipole, and I was running a K2 and a dipole, both in the QRP mode, because that's all that was available at that time. We were both very excited, <laughs> swapped, Q, swapped QSLs, QSL cards. So that, that, was, um, that was an exciting mode. Band dead, call CQ, New Zealand. Wow, okay, so that's an example of uh, quite unexpected contact and QRP was the mode. Okay, as I said, what makes the Q, uh, the uh, trail friendly radio and how did the really efficient small rigs come about? I think uh, Carl mentioned, well, he did mention the NorCal 40. So what was the NorCal 40? Well, it was a two, three watt radio, 40 meters only, limited uh, VFO, about 40 kilohertz worth, uh, had fair amount of drift if you're unless you want to set down, but it was uh, built around the enabler was the was the mixer, the 602 mixer became very popular, and the NorCal 40 had three of them. It had one as the main mixer, one as the product detector, and uh, one I think in the transmit mode. Yes. And these mixers uh, implemented a very nice analog multiplier. And that's the important thing. It still had a lot of, uh, you get a multiplier uh, in a mixer, you, you got to have some nonlinearity to act as the multiplier. So th this had a multiplier in it, a balanced mixer, and it worked quite well. It also had a fair amount of gain. And that combination in the 602 was very popular and it allowed you to implement a radio with a minimal of, of parts because uh, you use the mixer both in the transmit mode and in the receive mode. And that was the enabler. And this became the a very popular uh, rig that the NorCal uh, QRP club had configured and, and, and featured. And it was available in kit form. They sold a lot of them, very, very popular. So that was that was fun. I never bought one of those because I entered ham radio, re-entered ham radio. I entered ham radio back in the 1950s. And, um, uh, and then I was, uh, I think in college and my radio was stolen after I graduated. I had a, had a Heath kit HW12 on my car. And uh, I used to use that when I was a co-op student. I was in University of Detroit go up to Minnesota, and it was kind of my social experience getting into this uh, when I were at a co-op in a strange city. Uh, but I got stolen. In any event, then I got married, and then I had children, and then I had college bills. And it wasn't until my daughters were in college back in the late 1980s, 1989 or so, or 1990, I got back into our ham radio. And I guess it was 1998, I guess I got in. And Elecraft had just come out with the K2, and that was my uh, that was my re-entry back into ham radio. So uh, so that, that that's where where I got into it here. So I bought a K2, and that was initially a little bit of um, excuse me. I was attracted by the fact that it was a nice radio, good receiver and eventually would expand into a 100 watt radio. This particular picture shows the 100 watt radio, but I was QRP with the K2 
for several years uh, until they came out with the amplifier. And that was the starting of the Ellacraft Radio Company. Wayne and, and uh, Eric uh, were the founders of the Ellacraft Company. And they decided they had to have a radio that would get enough sales to get their company off the ground. And they were actually at a field day site, but they were operating probably with the North California, I'm not sure of that. But they sat down and they said, well, gee, if we took the elements of the NorCal 40, overcame some of its deficits and make it a multi-band radio, they basically sketched out the block diagram that I'm showing here for the K2. So it took the same key elements of the NorCal radio, which were based on that 602 mixer which had gain and a, a, a fairly linear mixer, not purely linear, but fairly linear. And, and they came up with the block diagram for the K2. And what they had to add was a good preamp, a good low noise preamp to get the signal noise ratio down. And they had to uh, add the multi-band filters. And they added a, an eight, a, a antenna tuner, 10 to one antenna tuner which is the same one that Carl likes to get to, the same design. And uh, uh, let's see here, a good filter, very, very good filter. These are a common filter here for both the transmit and the receive path. And they had a crystal uh, a CW filter that they would detune. It was a 200 Hertz filter. They would detune for like about 600 Hertz maximum on CW, and they also could switch in a side band filter, which gave a very flat response for about uh, two and a half kilohertz. So that became a very nice radio. That's the one I used uh, for several years, and I still use every year at field day. I take my K2, and that becomes the, the CW tent at our field day operations. Um, so let's see. I could go into more detail, but time time, but we'll not permit that. But I do want to mention uh, K2 is still available as a kit form. And I can't show a picture here, but I have a, a book in my hand here by Dr. David Rutledge, which he wrote a course um, down in Southern California as a professor around the NorCal 40. So the book is written as a textbook. If you were to build the NorCal 40, you build it a little bit at a time, and it gives you exercises uh, that you understand the principles involved. So I'll show you the, the book uh, when uh, uh, I turn it off again at the end. But the but this is an excellent way. You can buy the K2, which is based on the NorCal 40. So the book applies very, very closely. And the K2 is the same concept. If you build it, you're building section at a time. You're testing it. Make sure it's working and you're moving on. So I bought the book. I started to build the K2. It's a great education. So I heard that everybody wants to get a very traditional radio, understand everything when you're done. Uh, the K2 is still available and it becomes a very, very good radio. The receiver on the K2 is excellent. And I think uh, anybody who's used one would, would verify that. And I use it on, on a field day and people sit down, they operate the K2. It's easy to operate and great filtering. And we make great CW contacts in the CW tent on field day. So stop by our, our, uh, our, 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 our uh, field day site for the XARC up near, um, the, up near the Webster uh, Recreation Center. And you get a chance to operate a K2 if you want. Okay, so there we are actually at the field day site. This is when we were here at a uh, few years when we couldn't get back on the uh, on that uh, rec center. Uh, we were down at John Fisher College, but this is Bob and Larry operating the K2 on, on uh, field day. Uh, so also another uh, great exercise that I used was the Spartan sprints. And the Spartan sprints uh, have a the contest is the number of QSO points 
divided by the weight of the radio. Well, the K2 was pretty good, but I also had a KX1, which I'll talk about. But that's a great experience. And they're still available. You can get on, I think it's the first Monday of every month. You can do a start and sprint. And they are around the uh, QRP frequencies. And that's great fun. Everybody is running. They're trying, in fact, if you're an experimenter, people get in there and they try to get their weight well under one pound. And it's a number of contacts divided by the weight of the radio. Flight of the Bumblebees is another nice uh, field contest where you take your radio out and I would take the K2. In fact, Bob and I went out operating the K2 at Menden Ponds Park on a hill and we got a dipole, a folded dipole, F, excuse me, off-center dead by dipole, which is among my favorites. Get that up in the trees as high as you can get. And we had great fun. And uh, the internal battery on the uh, K2 operated about half the time. And then I switched over to a, a lithium polymer battery, which is the type of batteries the uh, helicopter uh, model helicopter people like. They're very light, very high power. So I powered the K2 off one of those for the rest of the contest. So I usually go out. I might take the K2 with me. Very good receiver. And I'll take a, two or three of the polymer batteries with me. And I've never used more than one after I run the battery down in the, in the K2. So another radio that came out uh, that modeled the uh, design of the NORCAL that same uh, mixer propagated it through there was the KX1. And that operated two watts, three bands, and uh, had, a, 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 had a very good VFO in it. The difference, the addition, addition here, you not only got the advantage of the integrated circuits for the 602 mixer, which gave you gain and a good mixer, they also introduced a direct digital synthesizer, DDS, local oscillator. So now like where the NorCal 40 was very limited in range with an analog VFO, the DDS gave you a full range digital VFO. That was very nice. Now, the DDS is direct digital signal generation. It does have phase noise. I never really let that bother me too much. But the purists saw that as a limiting factor and, and, and uh, didn't like it quite so much. But the KX1 had a, a good receiver, not nearly as good as the K2. So I didn't really keep the KX1 too long, maybe three or four years. It was fun using it as a one pound radio on the, uh, the Spartan Sprints. But I usually end up with the filter at minimum and the RF gain at maximum and the audio <laughs> gain at maximum uh, to get the signals out of the noise. So it was a bit of a challenge, and, uh, but it was a fun little radio. It was built on the same idea as the, as the NorCal. They could look at it, a NorCal 40 with three bands and a digital uh, synthesizer. So that made it for a very simple block diagram. Uh, the nor because it was digitally controlled, the VFO, the oh, the microprocessor is the other addition that made all this stuff possible because it was microprocessor controlled as the K2 was. And uh, this particular thing, all those binging there, people signing off, I guess, any event. <laughs> uh, this particular uh, capability made the back diagram very simple. So then I go in. And I sold my KX1 and I, I went down. I was going to buy either a K. I was going to, my plan was if I could sell my KX1, I'd buy a KX3. So I went down to, to uh, Dayton one year with Bob and I had that in mind, but I just gotten a little notice that they were going to coming out with the KX2. So I ended up buying a KX2 at Dayton because I had sold my KX1 for, I don't know, two thirds of what I paid for it. I figured that was pretty good. So now I have the KX2. Now the KX2 did a linear, at a phase lock loop uh, implementation of a VFO. And that was the SI5351 integrated circuit. 
which, uh, which became a sine and cosine quadrature detector. Now that's important because not only do you have the advantage of a very linear detector, you had the advantage that you would be detecting with, with a quadrature a reference signal, both sine and cosine. Now, not to go into the math, but that takes a lot of advantage of, uh, of, of more getting more information in the detector. And it's a very linear detector. And that is the same basis for the newer uh, implementations of QRP radios. So this has, a, this has this quadrature linear detector Plus, it has a not only the DS the uh, the uh, inter, uh, excuse me microprocessor control, but it has the DSP in it, which is a which uh, was available now in a Texas Instruments uh, DSP processor, and able to utilize a lot of the DSP processing that developed by Elecraft when they implemented the K3. So it has the K3 algorithms. It has the implementation of the latest uh, VFO technology and uh, a very, very nice implementation. I won't go through all the block diagrams. Uh, I can do that. Uh, let me see here. I'm going to skip this. This, this is going to run out of time here. Um, so here's the quadrature detector. It goes into the, the uh, DSP processor and it has the microprocessor as well. I'll make this available. People can study these diagrams, but this becomes a very, very nice. I actually use it on my, in the winter time in the family room. So family rooms on the air becomes a popular mode for me. <laughs> and you can see it's totally integrated. It has its own uh, key. It has just hook the antenna up cup of coffee and away you go. Also have the amplifier so that when the bands and conditions aren't so good for QRP, I can still stay warm in the family room in the wintertime and operate uh, with the KX2. Uh, but you might say that's probably more than I need. You might, you know, I don't need all those bands. I don't need, I don't need the quadrature, or rather I may need the quadrature detector, but I don't necessarily need it and I don't need to have a DSP processor. And that's what gave rise to what both Carl and Bob are talking about, the QRP lab receivers. It uses the quadrature detector, that, the, the same one that's used in the KX2, and it has the advantage of using a microprocessor based on the Arduino. So it, it really is taking the KX2, stripping out what might be considered redundant if you don't need so much, and it comes up with that $50 radio. So the point being, with the evolution of really great uh, integrated circuits and in the RF uh, processing, uh, the QRP field, field from the radio has evolved to something that is a, a delight to use. And that's, uh, Here's the diagram for the, uh, for the Q QCX that both Bobby and Carl talked about. It's got a microprocessor and it has this phase detector. It's got all the advantages of the quadrature phase detection and it eliminates the digital processor by implementing an analog version of the algorithms. And that's done in uh, using um, uh, linear amplifiers uh, op op operational amplifiers to implement the actual detection process. So that becomes, a, and this linear processing gets a very, very low noise uh, detection. And the analog processing gets a very clean implementation. So you end up with a very, very good receiver. And it's the same implementation as you would get if you bought the expensive KX2, you get the same features uh, by buying the QCX for one band and you don't get the DSP processing obviously, but that's, uh, that's a good way to start. And that's the same way the other presentations ended. A word about antennas at the end, dipole up as high as possible is probably your best solution. That's what Bob's doing for his, for his portable. 
Uh, I use my favorite off-center fed dipole. Uh, I call it my field day 40. It's the one I take to field day, put that up, and I can get operations on 40, 20, 15, and 10 with the K2 or the KX2. Another alternative I use when I visit my, my, my daughter down in uh, Maryland is a buddy pole, but not, not in the dipole mode. I don't find that too, too effective. I use the buddy pole, gives me an elevated mm -hmm. vertical. I have an extended vertical uh, element for that. And uh, I get that as, they actually it's the off-center fed where the long element for 20 meters is the vertical element. And then I use a single a counterpoise, which is the short part of the uh, antenna on the dive, off-center fed dipole. And I put that up in her backyard and I was working DX from uh, her family room uh, doing that. So that's, that's my uh, recommendation. You either get a dipole as high as you can or the off-center fed version gives you some advantage, multiple bands and um, there you are. Word about batteries. Uh, people have mentioned number of batteries. I said, I mentioned the, uh, I'm going to go off here. Uh, how do I turn this off? <laughs> there we go. Stop. Top, top of the screen. Yeah, there we go. go. So uh, these little batteries are the, are the field uh, polylithium, po excuse me, lithium polymer batteries and get these things charged up and I can run all afternoon uh, with my uh, KX2 or my K2 in the field or the KX2 is there for that better. Do you want to mention this book, the uh, Electronics for Radio? It really is a college course on radio and it takes you through the step by step each stage and it actually has questions and answers and experiments you can run as you build your radio a little bit at a time. I did it with the K2, it was very informative. You could um, do that, or you could, I think you can still buy the equivalent of a KX or a NorCal, but I'd recommend the K2 to be good for starters if you want to go through that book. Well, that's my spiel, any questions? Anybody got a question? Uh, I wanna make a comment. Uh, Ned is an aficionado, aficionado on designing off-center fed dipoles. Uh, he's modeled them for several people. Yep. I know uh, K2JSG, uh, uh, Jeff has uh, uh, used his and worked DX uh, uh, CC on it, uh, but uh, he, he's a great person. If you want him <coughs> to design an off-center fed for you, drop him an email. Uh, and that'll do that for you very nicely. Yeah, Given just the a word, the, the off-center fed dipoles, uh, I got into it kind of, out of necessity, I was hanging wires in the trees and my wife was complaining a little bit about the unsightly feed-ins and the drooping wires and all that. So I was looking around my yard as I was cutting lawns and I said, gee, I could run it right along the fence line in the back of my yard. I can get about a hundred and, if I kind of droop the ends, I can get 130 feet there. But if I can, I can hide the feed point on a, um, I, I got a, a, a military surplus vertical mast up about 30, 35 feet. And that was my feed point. And I supported that. And then I ran the long end along the fence line. So at the end, I could uh, tie it to a tree a little bit lower than the feed point. And then I could bring the other end down at a slope and tie it off. And uh, nobody's tripping over wires. The feed point was behind uh, uh, some tall uh, pine trees I had. And after I've been fussing with that for about two days, my wife asked me, where's this new antenna you're putting up? <laughs> I said, mission accomplished. My goal was my feet could not leave the ground and she didn't want to see it from the kitchen window. So it became a very, uh, very uh, stealth antenna as well as a very effective antenna. My first contact with that antenna, I was probably running 100 watts with the K2 at that point, or as a K3 at that point, actually, was a Christmas Island in the South Pacific. That was my first or second contact on 15 meters. So we've been using them at field day ever since, both for the mm -hmm. 80 meter and for my field day 40. Very effective. So I'll be glad to help anybody who wants with that. Now, Carl also held up a copy of that book. 
Want to tell yeah. your experience, Carol? Uh, it's a great book, but it comes with this oddly shaped thing in the bag. <laughs> you have any idea what to do with that? Well, what? What's that? Yeah. Oh, that, that, that's, a, that's, that's, a, a, that's a cup holder or a cup no, place. That's thing. a simulator. That's a network <laughs> simulator that you can use. Some of the exercises are built around that. Right, so but I don't have a computer anymore that reads these things. This is disassemble and take the little disc out of it. <laughs> oh, I would be glad to give you, I transfer that to anybody to, on, on a uh, stick if you want. <laughs> hey, Ned, I've got a uh, early K2, I think it's the, the Rev A, and I went to look to see if there's any mods for it. Apparently that's not moddable. Oh, no, 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 built... no, no. I put it, I have serial number 0476. Okay. Well, maybe I should contact you about it because that's the thing about resurrecting it. I built it with my son way back in like 1995 oh. or 98 or something like that. If I could easily turn my camera around, you'd see my embarrassment that I have a K3 and a KPA 500. But next to that, I have my K2. <laughs> so I still use it. It, it is, I bought it, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, history. When I first got into radio, I ended up with a uh, DX100 and an SX100 uh, back in the 1950s. And I had a real aversion to every time I bumped the desk, even with that nice receiver, it, it would jiggle, jiggle everything. I, you know, <laughs> I, I would uh, be able to hear the, uh, the, the receiver jiggles. I wanted a really solid radio, but I wanted to be able to build it so I knew what was in it. And I was scanning the magazines. There was this very little ad for a brand new company called Elecraft. And they said they had this K2 multi-band rock solid implementation. I downloaded the, uh, the, 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 the build book, the owner's manual for it. And I went through the schematic and I said, gee, this is exactly what I want. So I placed an order for it and they were still in field test with it. And it took four months or five months for it to come in because they just started. So I got off the first production run. So it was, I have a very early K2. It was expensive in that day's dollars too. Yeah. I know, I remember that. Well, it was, it's still, still expensive, 800 bucks. 799, I think, or something like that. Yeah. But it was, you know, 160 through 10. And the nice thing about Elecraft is all their mods they make available. If you go on the the uh, Elecraft site, you can order their mods and you can upgrade it yourself. And All right, they, they do have the K3 as well. Yeah, Todd's got his mic unmuted. Do you want to say something, Todd? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Ned for the sailboat powerboat analogy. Apparently that explains a lot of my psychology. Um, I have brought my QRP rig on my sailboat, looking at you know a 30 plus foot tall mast and thought how I could rig an antenna to it. And I always stop when I realize that all the stainless steel shrouds are all bonded to a 12 volt common. So anyway, <laughs> thanks. Load, load the steel, stainless steel. <clears throat> well, like wow. I say, it's, a, it's all bonded to 12 volt common for, for lightning protection, so. Well, that was an analogy I meant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of taking mine out on my on my aluminum canoe, but I haven't done that yet. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but it, it's it's very portable. But I mean, all of these Elecraft radios are portable. But the uh, the KX2 is uh, is 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 at my delight, <laughs> and uh, that is expensive though. But the interesting thing I wanted to make out that. The technology that makes the KX2 so good is the same technology that makes that little QCX that Carl and Bob are so excited about. I've been tempted to buy one, but I just haven't gotten to it yet. All right. Any more questions for the Ned? If not, we'll move on to okay, well, us. I'll, I'll, send, uh, I'll send Tim a copy of my presentation and I might add a few uh, links to it for you. Uh, send send it to Scott, <laughs> or, or send it to me. I'll I'll, I'll get it to Scott. He's okay. the webmaster that puts it all up. Okay. All right, Scott, you're on. You're not. You're muted too. You were talking before. Yep. 
I went to uh, share mode, and of course the menus all changed around. I apologize for that. Yeah, Ned, send it over to me, and I apologize for wearing the same dress to the uh, dance tonight. So my style is exactly the same. Um, <clears throat> I'm probably the not probably am the least experienced here. Everybody has been presenting, um, but I'm going to talk about some of the radios that I have and I've played around with. Um, that are Zaiju radios, and I'll give you an option to to take a look at things that are pre-built. Uh, just a little bit of background. These guys have been the guy uh, BG8HT has been around for a while. In fact, I found some of his early papers and things on some of the um, radios he was planning on building. So they're a fairly small company in China, and uh, it's kind of interesting. On one of his things, uh, they they basically talk about trying to make sure <laughs> Chinese products are quality products. Um, so I assume they don't use Chinese capacitors then. Uh -huh. But um, uh, you know, they seem to make some pretty, pretty nice stuff. So I thought I would just talk about two of the offerings here that, that I have, the G90 and the G, G1M. Uh, they do offer other things as well. And I'm just gonna quickly run down this. So basically I've seen a couple of people using this and I have one in my experience. Uh, I take a, took it right out of the box and brought it into well, one of the Ra Ra board meetings before yeah. the meeting. Yeah. Tim happened to have brought his buddy pole with that he just got. And uh, so we set it up and I think uh, it was about two seconds and it made with the 13 colonies, whatever it is, contacts yeah. right away. Um, it, it's, uh, it's actually a really neat little radio. Um, it's a lot of fun. Uh, so I'll just kind of go through some of the things about it. Basically it's, a, it's SDR. So we're running uh, all the way from 0.5 up to 30. Uh, the transmit is uh, enabled only just like the thing, like the 7300, a lot of other radios for uh, the amateur bands in the US. Um, you can go in there and do some mods. I've seen some people lift a couple of resistors and just like you can with the 7300 and do other things with it. Uh, supports uh, basically all your basic modes. Uh, it's got a lot of filtering in it, which is nice. It's up to 20 watts increments in a watt for power. It does have a built-in antenna tuner, which is also nice. Uh, you can see the form factor here. You've got your front panel. That's a 1.8 inch, um, nice bright display. I will say for old fat fingers uh, and <clears throat> not so great eyes, you can kind of squint at this. Uh, so there's, there's a little bit of a small factor. So it's nice for size, but not so nice in terms of being able to get at all of the features. The front panel is actually detachable. It comes with essentially a DB9 connector, kind of looks like an old RS-232 cable, uh, which is about six feet long. So you can take this and set it on a table, lay it flat and, and put the, uh, the actual electronics head someplace else, or want to do that mobile, whatever the case happens to be. Um, again, it does have an antenna tuner built in. Apparently you can get the SDR output, the I and the Q out. I haven't played around with that um, to, to mess with it. I see you have a typo in here. I will say it's, uh, it's, it is small, it's rugged, and it's fairly lightweight. Uh, it, 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 it feels like a little tank when you pick it up. Taking a look at the display, it does have a waterfall and the uh, spectrum scope on it which is nice. That's not as full featured as you find on some other radios. Uh, and again, there is, cause it's 1.8, a bit of a squint factor. And I know we mentioned that I'm one of the youngsters on the group here, but still for me, it's a bit of a squint factor to get in there and uh, read that. The mode and the band are up on top, which is, seems a little bit odd, but I guess it's one of the things you're pressing the most. If you're setting it on a table, you don't have to hold the radio then to, uh, to push the button because some of the other buttons you kind of have to use, either hold it with your hand and kind of hit it with your thumb uh, or the radio is going to tend to move around a bit. <clears throat> this is basically what it comes with. I'm going to go through the full unboxing. Uh, I'm going to say that um, the manual, when I first got it, wow, it was like roughly translated Chinese. There was still a lot of Chinese glyphs and things in it. Uh, not very good. I think they're on the third version now. In fact, when I was doing the research for this, I found it's a much better manual from Radio Oddity. Um, my only complaint about it is not searchable and it's not linked. Uh, it's basically images, uh, but it's nice and clean and easy to read and they cover a lot of the features in a lot more detail. Uh, power cable, and yeah, that leaves a lot to be desired. I built a new one for that. And of course, put Anderson power poles on it. 
Uh, here you can see the connections from the side. Your mic is on the side and your um, headphones are on the side. You can detach the side protection things if you'd like. Um, I did have problems with this. I haven't resolved it yet. The headphones, when I plug them in, I, the speaker continues to go. I don't know if that is an electrical mechanical problem with uh, maybe internally there's a solder blob on this or something that is not actually switching over or if that is a software thing. And I haven't had time to go try and figure that out. As I mentioned, it is fairly small. Uh, you can see it here, uh, weighs about three and a half pounds. Like I said, it is a bit of a little tank. Uh, it's very rugged, very well built. I bought mine from Radio Oddity and I'm not pitching Radio Oddity. I will say, looking at MFJ and other places in the US, um, they spent the time to make nice manuals and their prices were competitive. So that's where I went. Uh, and it came fairly quickly. And I've had the radio now for about two years, a little, actually a little over two years. There are some other accessories with it. And I've seen some other folks out during the um, uh, Winterfest, uh, one of the gentlemen came with the nice cooling rack here. The cooling rack, I guess, can be used if you're really probably on the digital modes. Uh, if you're gonna push it up to 20 Watts, uh, you may wanna have that on there, but it comes with one thing that's nice here. It's got the Anderson power poles built right into it. It also, I noticed now has uh, a nice large TFT screen. So that can be attached on as well. I assume that replaces the head. I do not have that. I have to say though, when you start adding these accessories on, now you're looking at a thousand bucks. Uh, so now you might want to take a look at other options from ICOM or, or, or other people because you really have changed your price point on the radio and the set of radio. Same thing's true if you do decide to go for the power amplifier, that's about 500 bucks as well. So kind of to me, it's I have a 7300, why would I want to spend all that dough uh, on this when I can kind of do the same thing in that type of form factor. Another offering that came out a little bit later from Zygu was the uh, GM1, which basically is a much smaller, much lighter um, true QRP. It's basically five watts. Um, and it's got a nice bright display, <clears throat> but it is black and white. Um, they have added an AM broadcast receive mode in the firmware and a bunch of other things in the firmware, which is nice. I've only played with this a little bit. I have to say, I've not gotten a chance to get out in the field and do things with these radios the way I'd like to. You can come on the 22nd. I plan on it. I do indeed plan on it. And I did buy myself a uh, the buddy pole set up. So I'm gonna actually might set it up this afternoon because it's not windy like it was yesterday. Um, again, you got the supports interfacing with the PC. There's lots of interfacing on both both radios. Uh, it does have uh, you know then basically this is the stuff that comes off that what they what they have they've got lots of the connections and things and um, it's it's a nice little QRP radio it's small I have one complaint with it and I'll get to that in a moment um, you know and again it's easy to carry it's really tiny but the mic leaves a lot to be desired and the other thing too is that this accesses the menus when you press the menu button you get what's below here, it takes a bit of learning and the manual, the first manual I had did not match what the radio was actually doing. So uh, that was a bit of a learning curve. And I've also seen people on uh, YouTube when you look, put nicer knobs on both radios here because this knob is a little on the, on the cheesy side. Uh, audio volume is a little on the lower end in terms of uh, uh, volume. So that too, I would recommend headphones with it. On the back side, this one kind of being in line, I think this is more QRP-ish, has a BNC connector. So you can see what you have there. The uh, uh, G90 has the standard SO239 on it. And again, the link on here. This runs about 270 bucks. It was kind of weird again, as I was looking around the build uh, to create this presentation, somebody had it for $70 and I have to go back and see if I can find that again. Maybe just buy it. Probably it's one of those eBay things. You get the box for 70 bucks. Um, but again, I, I think in terms of the overall price point, I'm really kind of disappointed it doesn't have a color display considering how cheap those things are today. Um, you know, at this amount of dough that you spend for it. So that's basically what I have. I hope to get some more mileage out of these and play with them a lot more. 
and uh, and actually get out. I also have done the QCX, and I found that uh, exceptionally enjoyable to build. And I did buy the mini as well. And the kid is sitting here waiting for my fat fingers to wind tar rides or a tar ride and put that together. So that's basically what I have for the kind of put together stuff you can buy out of the box. Any questions? Anybody got questions for Scott on the side group? By the way, uh, one of those will be on the air. One of our uh, presenter or uh, participants, uh, uh, what's his name? Mike uh, N2MAK has got one of those. He's He just got his Wolf River uh, vertical uh, and he's going to set it up this afternoon. <laughs> and uh, he's he's setting it up right now and he's going to be on 20 meter uh, sideband. I told him I'd meet him after this on uh, 14240. Uh, so he's a general class. So I had to move it up to the general band. But uh, so if you want to listen in on 20 meters this afternoon, see if you can contact one of these radios, see how it sounds. Uh, Have you looked uh, at the uh, 5105 from Zygu? Yeah, that's the one I think actually you're talking about, Tim. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't looked at that yet. I saw it going by. They have a couple other the older radio as well. Um, so does anybody here play with that? Well, I've got a 90 and a 5105, and I actually like the 5105 better. I don't have yeah. a lot of time with both of them, but just the layout and how it operates, the 5105 looks like a more packable, more transportable, and actually a more fun radio. Now that does that have a that has a passive LCT display, right? Yeah, it's black and white. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but it's yeah. As, uh, meaning that it probably works a lot better in sunlight. Oh yeah, like it's beautiful in sunlight. It's got a tuner that works great. Um, it'll tune up my dipole easy, which is already pretty close. But I mean, I suspect that it'll do well. What is uh, that? Uh, what does that one cost? Uh, what did I pay for that? It was uh, four fifty or no? Yeah, I think it's four sixty. Yeah. Okay. I saw that it was offered. How when did that come out? I, I don't know. I've seen uh, stuff on YouTube. It's over three years old. So oh, okay. it's somewhere in that a area. Well, at any rate, uh, that's is what I've been playing with. I have a bunch of other radios, obviously. Um, but I got these guys up and I, like I said, I have seen them around. People that, that who've done reviews on them seem to like them. And um I do know I'm looking at, I have to go back and do some updates on the firmware. Apparently there's a bunch of other firmware updates. I haven't played with digital modes yet. I think that might be my next thing to do is try FT8 with it. Good. Ed, have you done that with uh, FT8 and stuff? No, I've only had mine for probably four months. So I'm just figuring the radio out. So as I do things, I'll let people know, but yeah. A lot of people on YouTube have done it, so I've got a lot of things to learn from. So, yeah, there's no one thing that either of these radios have, and maybe the other one does, is it does not have a built in sound interface. So, you have to use analog. Although, there is a little thing I'm thinking about buying now that has an interface um, to the computer. So, we'll see how that works. I think it costs about 70 bucks. That does a bunch of different things. <clears throat> Okay, any more questions, comments? All right, I would say uh, this concludes our Academy session on uh, QRP and operation. I think I wanna thank our presenters, Carl Heinz Kramer, Bob Cars, Ned Asim and Scott Tice for sharing their experiences and their equipment. And a uh, couple of things, uh, coming up events. Uh, April 10th will be an Academy a uh, Zoom presentation on EME and satellite communications by Larry Keene, KD2LGX, who's done a lot of that. In fact, uh, I was speaking with him this week and uh, last week uh, he had a QSO with China via EME. So you guys that wanna work DX, <laughs> if you wanna work China, you gotta shoot for the moon. And he did that. He was very uh, uh, excited about that. I'm sure he'll tell you about it in his presentation uh, on April 10th. Um, also coming up, we mentioned it uh, May 22nd, uh, Rara uh, will have an in-person, our first uh, in-person uh, uh, academy at a local park here. Attendees uh, will help set up antennas, operate HF, VHF, QRP, maybe even FT8, if I can get Dave Timmons to bring his uh, 450 out in uh, 
uh, is uh, FT450 in the computer out there and run some FT8. Uh, there will be COVID restrictions. You will be wearing a mask. I, I've been inoculated, but uh, we uh, want you to uh, mask up. And uh, there's a limited amount of participants uh, due to the size of the shelter. It's an open air shelter. It's not a closed shelter, but they're, we're gonna be limited to uh, 35 attendees. And uh, every station uh, that you uh, come up to will have hand sanitizer. So before you touch anybody's equipment, you will sanitize your hand and uh, we'll have wipes there to wipe down microphones. You can remove your mask to uh, call CQ or respond to a QSO. Um, so uh, to register for either of these academies, uh, education at rochesterham.org, send me an email through that uh, link and uh, we'll put you on the roster and give you details about uh, each of them as they come up. Uh, you can connect uh, to find that uh, more information at rochesterham.org and also a new group. Uh, it's not new, uh, we transferred out of our Yahoo group we have groups IO uh, at Rochester Ham. Uh, the link is at our website and on the uh, rah rah rag. So please, uh, there's about, I think 107 uh, uh, people signed up for that. So if you've got a question, you can send it to me. You can send it to one of our Elmers. You can put it on, uh, there's many ways of getting information uh, here. So in, if you have an interesting topic or presentation you wanna do for an academy, let me know. and. Uh, uh, send your ideas to education at rochesterham.org. Again, thank you very much, gentlemen, for uh, the time you put in and preparing this and showing us your operations. Uh, a lot of good rigs out there. And later this year, uh, one of the estates that I uh, am looking at, uh, once it gets probated, we'll have some of these uh, uh, QRP radios uh, going up for sale. Uh, so watch the rah-rah rag for those and uh, the groups IO, I will announce them on those uh, later on this year. Any more comments, questions? Thank you very much. We had a total of 35 attendees to begin with. It waned off at the end a little bit, but people do get uh, uh, other obligations here. So uh, we try and keep it to about uh, two, two and a half hours. Thank you very much. You have a great weekend. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. Nice presentation by everybody. Thank you very much. It was excellent. Thanks, Thanks. everybody. Thank you. Hi. Thanks a lot, guys. Seven threes. Seventy threes. Seventy threes. Thank you. Seventy three.